Hi, and welcome to the Handbag Designer 101 podcast with your host, Emily Blumenthal, handbag designer expert and handbag fairy godmother, where we cover everything about handbags from making, marketing, designing, and talking to handbag designers and industry experts about what it takes to make a successful handbag. Welcome, my dear, sweet Tola Adiabo from (laughs) Florian, London, creative director, founder, inspirer, everything amazing. (laughs) Tola, welcome to Handbag Designer 101, the podcast. Thank you for having me, Emily. Thank you so much for having me. I've had you a few times. (laughs) Yes, you've had me a few times. (laughs) (laughs) Just to dive right in, considering Mm -hmm. Florian was a Handbag Awards winner, an audience fan favorite. You are clearly not from the United States. What's your story? Where'd you come from? Where were you born? All that good stuff. Currently, I live in London, but I wasn't born in London. So I grew up in Lagos, Nigeria. So I was born in Nigeria. I came to London when I was 11. So from 11 till now, I've not been to everybody my age. It's vague. (laughs) It's a vague blur. Very vague. (laughs) <laughs> very precisely. So I spent most of my adult life in the UK, in London. So you were born in Nigeria. You came here at 11. And you that was the first time you were on an airplane and everything. Do you remember packing up and being told, all right, that's it, sweet little Tola. We're, we're getting out. We're going to London. And you were like, Woo, wow, what's that going to be? <laughs> yeah, I think my dad had already moved to London and my so did my mom actually. We were living with my grandmother. So, it so who was, flew you uh, over? I came with my mom. So my parent already had, you know, they just came over to get me and my older sister. So I had an older sister already living in the UK that I'd never met as well. <gasps> so they were just bringing us to join them in the United Kingdom. So I think that was really the start. <laughs> How long oh, were you living goodness. with your grandma? So from. From about six, from about six, I think. So I lived with my grandma and my dad moved over to the, uh, my dad moved over to London and my mom used to travel between London and the UK. So my mom would go and come back or come back. And I think when they got settled in the UK, then they came to get me and my sister as well. So (laughs) do you think though that experience of, you know, having your parents, not having your parents, like it makes you grow up really fast. You know, like even if you don't even realize, I mean, you accept it as normal, like this is it, but not having your parents and I'm sure your grandma was a force to be reckoned with, but it's not easy. Well, yeah, do you know what? We never felt like that because I think the African culture, the culture back home was very family orientated. So it mm. wasn't really a case of, I think when you're thinking in the Western world, being with your grandma can be very isolating, but it wasn't like that. So I had my cousins, right? Um, I had this and this. It was like a big family home. So we never really felt like we were missing our parents, so to speak. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine like, your girls being like, we're good. <laughs> we're good. You know, do, do you know what, you know, like, I think when you live in, in London, and, you know, you live in, I don't know, it's very, I think, like I said, the culture is very different. So you still mm. part of a community. So your family, it's kind of extended. So your cousins, you're not everybody's family. So everybody's yeah. your sister. Like, you so know, it must have been isolating for you coming to London and then leaving all that because here you are so in this very homogenous community and now you're not now you're having to basically start all over i'm sure you were pretty self-conscious of your accent how you looked being thrown into a new place now having to wear a different uniform and you have a sibling you said you'd never met like wow it's a lot i know i'm so glad you mentioned that because when i i mean like i said growing up in nigeria i was very confident i didn't really experience i didn't really feel like I didn't feel this difference. I didn't really mm. feel like, oh, my accent is different. I didn't really feel I was such a now I like to think naive and naive in a good way. Yeah. Naive. Yeah, I'll come into London full of dreams, you know. You were well, I mean, you were in a protected yeah. bubble, so it's fair. I don't exactly, think you should have yeah. you should apologize <laughs> for being a child that felt safe enough to dream. I mean, that's yeah. what you want for your kids. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. 
And it's, I'm so glad you mentioned that because when I came to UK, I experienced severe bullying. And, I, you know, you mentioned exploring has been 10 years. And I think the experience I had in secondary school in this country, especially being so confident and being so outspoken and coming to school and, you know, being laughed at for my accent, being laughed at because I was so bubbly, <laughs> being laughed at mm-hmm. because I was so full of confidence and just learning that the bullying was really, you know, the, I might get just a little bit emotional thinking about it now, especially because I have two daughters. You know, people say that I, I smell because I'm from Africa, I smell South Africa. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was really horrendous when I came then. I mean, things have changed now. But it was severe bullying and not just, and it wasn't, I, it was really bad. And I think when I look back at that little girl and I look back at the reason why, you know, running a brand is a roller coaster of different emotions. It's, you're trying to hang in there, you're trying to be resilient. But I think the easiest thing for you to do is to just quit and get mm-hmm. a nine to five. And I think looking at that little girl and looking at the way I've ran Florin and just, holding on and knowing that very soon this brand that I've poured so much passion so much of myself into would eventually get its turn uh, precisely so you know at which I am you know growing up and being a London resident but it was never you know it wasn't easy <laughs> I mean it's so funny because you know I know so many people like you, and I'm not minimizing you or your story, but you know, there's so many people who you have to know how to weather the storms. You have to know how to be resilient, how to be scrappy and how to just keep pushing forward. And it's funny that, you know, the mindset, it's like you're growing up in a very risk averse environment and home because your family being immigrants and so forth, there's a book you have to follow. There's rules to be followed. There's expectations. However, in order to succeed, you have to bend all those rules in order to get around what's expected, right? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. it's kind of like running a business. You dive in and most of it's naivete, most of it's ignorance because you don't know what the hell you're doing, let alone the handbag (laughs) brand, right? Which, you know, let's get a little bit into it. So after you finished high school or sixth form or whatever you people call it with your lovely <laughs> levels, O levels, Q levels, P levels, whatever, <laughs> I still haven't figured it all, all the levels out. But within the UK, did you go to university after? And then what did you do after? Because I'm uh, sure as an immigrant child, the expectations were very high. Yeah. I mean, I was very good at maths and also very artistic. So a lot of, like like I said, I was very bullied, um, mm. but I never really succumbed to it. So I used to do a lot of them. Um, I found my escape through design. Mm. Uh, I used to do a lot of paintings. I was very artistic. And I remember that. Did you come home and paint kind of thing? Yeah, I did. I did. I stayed after school painting and I used to paint all the time. And when it was time for me to go to university, I mean, for my A-levels, which is what you do. A-levels are first. Yeah, A-levels and then university. So you start. Right. Yeah. So you do your A-levels. <laughs> and I did business studies, IT, and art and design. I'm always sneaking it in. Because like I said, with immigrant parents. Yeah, you can't, you can't do art. It. You can't do art. Right. Okay, she's so doing what? it because, you know, she's doing, she's doing economics and she's doing business. Yeah. Uh, and and by the way, here's it. some pretty pictures she's painted, by the way. Exactly. Yeah, yeah you know, she's just, this is just a little obby, you know. <laughs> uh, but, but when I went to university, it was like, a like what do I do now? I really wanted to study fashion design, but I could not, for the life of me, say that to my parents. Like I said, with, right. um, with our culture, it's very, you can't just go up and be like, yeah, this is what I'm doing and this is final. No, you, right. you know, your parents are very much part of your life and I was an 18 year so I studied finance <laughs> at university so I graduated from there with a you know two one which is like first class and it's two one and then so on and so forth and I started working in the city as an analyst for the city for people don't know it's the wall street of London essentially Precisely, yeah. right, I was working right. in the bank I was working in a banking sector so can very you imagine different. that now <laughs> I could not. I really little toddler in a bank. <laughs> I was I was <laughs> which <laughs> I can't even imagine it now. But you know, I was working in the bank. <laughs> I was an analyst. 
you know, nine to five, going to, you know, just boring. Yeah. Well, I don't mean to say it's boring for everybody. For no, me, no, 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 no. Yeah, you felt yeah. like your soul was stifled, like you've done everything you were supposed to. Now you're doing what you're supposed to. But now what? Yeah. I had a moment uh, like that with my first job. And I remember sitting and staying late with the bright office lights coming in. And I was still in my 20s. And I'm like, Jesus, if this is what my life's supposed to be, I think I'm dead already. It's <laughs> like, <laughs> no. Yeah. So that's how I feel. I mean, for me, it was like, this is not me. This is not what I really want to do. I'm doing it, you know, to get by. Not to get by, even so to speak. Just, you know, I'm just doing it. To do the right thing. Just to do the right thing. Exactly. That's the words I'm looking for. Um, Luckily for me, well, not luckily. At that time, I thought it was the end of the world. Got married. I was pregnant with my first daughter and I was made redundant. Because he was doing a financial crash. Yeah. Right. Again, just to decrypt that, you were laid off. Yeah, I was laid off. Yes. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> this is like, this is educational X50 already. So, yeah. you know, we're global audience. <laughs> so okay. you were pregnant. Did that kind of freak you out? Or were you like, oh, thank God? A part of me was like, oh, thank God. You know, I didn't really want it anyway. So now I'm going to be a single mom. You know, because it was my first child. I just really want to nurture and just be this mom right, right, and just stays right. on. And, you know, yeah. So that was what I wanted to do. Really. I thought, you know, I'm going to figure it out once my daughter has five. And so I was laid off, made sure to there. And after seven months of being a mom, I'm like... Are you ready to lose your mind? <laughs> What's me? I can't do this. I'm so... I just felt like I was losing myself. I mean, I've been to so many talks about being a mom and losing your identity. I really felt like I was losing myself, you know, going to the baby mother groups. I had the heart, you know, this this, <laughs> this is not me. And I started looking for a job, actually. I didn't really. And at the same time, I was buying bags, you know, buying second-hand bags, adding a bit of stuff to it, redesigning it, reconstructing it. How did that happen? So I was just doing that because I was bored, just being a with my daughter yes i was doing that before you know what kind I, of bags were you buying so i was going to port of Bello road in notting hill and i was buying vintage bags mm. um i was then you know taking them to be refurbished because the levers are worn out then i'll stitch some little designs in it and then i'll sell it to family and friends uh, so it kind of became I- like purposeful on the hunt like you would go to portobello road and like look for bags that had some sort of authentic DNA and say, oh, I could do something with this and I could do something with that. And then, and I I get that. And that kind of gives you a purpose. And then every week you would then go to Portobello Road. Like then all of a sudden you were on a mission every week. Like this is what I'm doing now. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. So I was just doing that just on the side. Was it really a business? And that organically happened. It was one day you were like, oh, I could do something with that. Yeah, yeah. Just one day, just thrown in, in shopping, and just thinking, oh, I can really do this. But like I said, it was a hobby that I was in on the side. When my daughter was about seven months, I'm learning like, to get back to work. But it was very close to the financial crash. I, I think I walked into like employers, not demanding, but like, you know what? I want four days in the office, one day at home. And it's like, is she crazy? I mean, it's normal now, but back then it was like... Oh, forget it. I mean, yeah. Especially it. being a woman, especially being a mom, they were like, who are you to demand something like that? Yeah, exactly. So eventually, you know, my husband and me, so we, then he was like, why don't you just start your own business? Like you have so much passion for design that let's start um, flooring and that, was the beginning of Flora in London and if we started thinking about it again it's so ironic now because I wasn't very keen to start with at first and it was almost like he sold me the idea <laughs> so um, our f- John we're talking about our friend John yeah comma your <laughs> husband so yeah. was it his idea to call it Florian like what's the origin it of was, that it was his idea to call it Florian in came up with that. I think he was trying to rescue his wife and he was trying to rescue me even mentally as well because it was almost like I couldn't find a job. I wanted flexibility because remember, when I was made redundant, I really wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. But also, you know, I also couldn't do that as well as like trying to find that balance. 
So I think I was struggling a lot. And right. I think Florian started from a place of the name Florian actually means growth, watching flowering and nurturing something and watching it grow. And this was what <laughs> said to him, I thought, okay, I like that name because he came up with all different names. And I'm like, yeah, I like that name. Right, you know, Sam. The name is, yeah, the name Florian just stuck with me. So that's how Florian started. <laughs> Aw, it's so funny because the sensibility of your bags, I think what's always drawn me to them has been the uniqueness of the silhouette, the DNA, yeah. the color. And I think they definitely have a vintage feel to it. And I mean, being as a handbag person, I feel confident in saying I can speak to the authenticity of the silhouettes and, you know, the cutout handles and so forth, that it definitely has always had its own DNA, very throwback and having the confidence to do color, which back then was really hard to come by. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you ever wanted to start a handbag line and didn't know where to start, this is for you. Proof that independent designers can make it big. I absolutely Blumenthal, who is my prime example. If you had dreams of becoming a handbag designer and didn't know where to start, this is for you. If you have a handbag brand and are in need of strategy and direction, this is for you. I'm Emily Blumenthal, handbag fairy godmother and handbag designer expert, and this is Handbag Designer 101, the masterclass. Over the next 10 classes, I will break down everything you need to know how to make, market, and manufacture a handbag. Broken down for you that you'll not only skip steps in that handbag building process, but also save money in that learning curve. For the past 20 years, I've been teaching at the top fashion universities in New York City, created the Handbag Awards, and also the Handbag Designer 101 podcast. I'm going to show you like I have countless brands from sketch to sample to shelf, whether you're just starting out and don't know where to begin, or even if you have a handbag line and just need some strategic direction, the Handbag Designer 101 Masterclass is just for you. So let's get started and you will be the creator of the next it bag. Join me, Emily Blumenthal, with the Handbag Designer 101 Masterclass. When I started designing bags for Florian, I really wanted to design something and I, I like the fact that you mentioned color. Something that injects color into the everyday because like you know London is very gloomy very <laughs> yeah, very rainy <laughs> it can be very depressing sometimes so I work with a lot of colors and my aesthetics are very bold which embodies you know kind of my personality as well and I want the fur woman to feel confident so when I'm designing the bag I want something that would last as over season, so more or less seasonless, aesthetic right. needs to be very strong, but yet feminine. So it's like trying to find those two balances. So a lot of our design kind of just marry both boldness and, you know, femininity. <laughs> How did you, though, go from buying these vintage bags and getting them refurbished to, you know, like you definitely had some sort of practice or academic, you know, in terms of design, like you had the basics, but how did you go from that to getting your first sample, to getting your first order, to getting your first stockist? Because that's like a bit of a, that's an, a jump, especially yeah. with John being like, Hey, give it a go. And it's like, well, where do I start? Like, what did you do? I, we worked very closely together. The first thing that really gave us that seal of approval it's the Amber Gold. And I know I've said this before. E John applied for it. I think I was so because like, like I said, the first thing we tried to do is find suppliers and then started learning about never started learning about what works, what doesn't work, what materials you want to work with. So those are all behind the scenes and that takes a lot of time. And even now I'm learning. I think you're learning on the go. I traveled to China, I traveled to Spain, to so many different places, even within Europe, trying to find supplies for the bags. That was even before we launched a website for the bag. Um, so do you recommend that? I, I actually do. I think it's important because sometimes the easy part is, you know, finding a name for your brand. All those things are very like, 
encouraging. At the end, <laughs> yeah, it's very surface. Yeah. Very encouraging, like. But it's very fantasy because you're just stuck. You know, yeah, I want my website to look like this, and I, 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 you know, I mentor a lot of people where they spent so long on the aesthetics of the website, but there's nothing with about no the product. product. Yeah, but they're like, yeah, what well, I'm going to get samples made, but there's no product, and there's nothing. So I would say, like, research your products first, research the market first, research your competitors. Who's in what you're doing? What's the price point? What's your unique selling point? Why are you different? As you know, that every market is saturated now. There's no new idea under the sun. It's like, what are you bringing is different? And those questions, you have to be really honest with yourself. I would even advise you to get a consultant because I asked myself those questions, but was I honest with myself? I don't think so. <laughs> I just say, yeah, this is easy. You know, there are competitors. You know, we can design bags that look like this and we can sell it to A. You know, we know our target market. But you need someone that would help you evaluate the market properly and help you kind of decide, do I really want to do this? Do I really want to spend my life savings mm-hmm. and all my time and effort stuff in this business? Is it truly my passion or is it, I don't know. An expensive hobby. Is my passion viable? Yeah, exactly. Is my passion viable? Those are really important questions More now more than ever. Mm-hmm. So that's. Sort of, um, I don't know if I've lost the question. <laughs> well, you know, how did you figure out to get your first sample made? How did you go from there? Was it like a Google search? Oh. Like, like it's so funny when you're unfamiliar with the process, you don't even realize it's called a sample. Okay, so what I pay for the sample isn't going to be what I pay for production. Oh, so my samples, I shouldn't get done at the same place where I do my production. But you think you need to do everything at the same place. You want to have everything done locally, domestically, so you can, you know, sit on top of your manufacturer. And then you realize they hate you that much more because you don't know what you're doing and you're a pain in the butt. And then they're like, okay, I'll do the sample. Now you need to go away. And you're like, oh, I need to start over again. Now what? So yeah. it's this learning curve cycle. There's a lot. I, I think was important, and I would advise anybody to find a mentor, find somebody that's done it before, or sometimes even pay somebody. Because I remember not knowing what a MOQ was. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm like, and what's what an MOQ? Like and what's an yeah, MOQ? Minimum, yeah, minimum order quantity. There's there's so many different terminologies that you know absolutely nothing about. So. I mean, Google is your friend now. Everybody <laughs> is that. All you have to do is go on Instagram, go on social media, go on Google, and then you think, you know, you can just start a business. So back then, finding my suppliers, I went into Google, but then I traveled as well because I wanted to see the... How did you tell myself. John, like, I need to go to Italy, I need to go to Spain, and this is a work trip, or was he like, go for it? Yeah, he was like, go for it. And sometimes <laughs> we went to Spain together. But I went to China by myself and that was, you know... Was that terrifying? That terrifying, but also a massive learning curve as well. So I've learned <laughs> so much through that, that, that you know, um, trying to make our samples in China and then deciding we want to, you know, produce in China and the, what we faced there, oh my goodness, almost ended the business as well. So I've learned so much over the years. Are you... Because I know you also, and I could be incorrect, I know... You produced in Spain. I believe you may or may not have produced in Portugal. How are you able? I mean, you're lucky being in the UK that for you to go to Spain is a lot. It's like us going to Florida, but without the same benefits. Mm -hmm. So how? (laughs) I'll take Spain over Florida for a short trip. But how, how are you able to make these decisions and come to these conclusions? Like, okay, the MOQ for China was too difficult, or I can't have the same control, or... I don't know how the taxes and duties have impacted China and UK versus China and the US, but I know it's almost prohibitive right now for somebody to do small production runs from here to there. And it's better to go into almost a European country. So how have you navigated all of that? So uh, when I started, the initial thing was to actually produce because I thought Florida, London, we're going to make everything in the UK. In London. So I went, yeah. So we went to Somerset where Burberry samples and I took a trip there found find a manufacturer there but the only thing again it was really really expensive because part of what I wanted to do was to have bags at an attainable price point so I didn't really mm. wanted to compete with luxury brands but it was impossible to do that and anyway, what what was the tenable price point so I didn't really want to go over 500 pounds for a bag so we didn't really want to 
I'd say that, but it's been made in the UK. I mean, the quantities were very small, but the prices were ridiculous. But then with the UK manufacturing as well, because like I said, a lot of my bags are very structured and mm. they struggle to produce that. I mean, we wasted so much money at first. And that's a learning curve. Samples. That was a learning curve. We produced in London first our samples. And I remembered after the third sample, I'm like, they're never going to get it. This is not what I had on paper. So did that's you, why did you look story. into Cambridge just out of curiosity, knowing that Cambridge, <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like I spoke to Julie Dean from Cambridge Satchel. Like she built the factory. Mm. Yes. yes. Yeah. And then she works with vegetable town leather. So it's very different. I think they work very well with that in the UK, but not, not so much like normal calf skin leather. It was really difficult. Even buying mm. the leather. In the UK, it was imported from Italy. It was like, I just need to go to the source. Right. Uh, so it was really difficult. I think we need to invest in the UK in our manufacturing, especially right. for and bags and leather goods, but it's a topic for another day. Maybe not for you. <laughs> <laughs> I know who they should hire to be that spokesperson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in conclusion, after you went through all this, you went through a few countries, right? You did do production in Spain for a while too, didn't you? Yes, yeah, so I went to Spain. I actually made it. We went to Spain to produce, to do like a short production of a particular bag. But then the structure styles that I was designing, they recommended I, I'll go to China. So they're like, you know what? Best for you to go to China because, wow. it's, you know, we have, they say to a lot of these designs, they would get it much easier in China. So I'm like, okay, yeah. <laughs> then I'm saying that's why I took the trip to China. I'm like, okay, you know, people frown up on China, but I'm going to, you know, take a chance and go to China. And it, it kind of started okay, but then it just turned out to be a disaster and then came back to Europe. <laughs> so where are they produced now? Uh, bags are produced in Turkey. So I finally, after many years of like working with so many different, you know, uh, manufacturers, we found a third generation um, at yeah. Ilya yeah. in Turkey and they produce all the bags now. So they take a lot of pride in what we do is ethical. It's everything I wanted. It took me five years, six mm. years of trying so many different suppliers and yeah. so many different manufacturers to find somebody that I'm really comfortable with. It's definitely a journey. And, you know, I've spoken to designers from all over, from Mexico, from Morocco, from Turkey. I'm trying to think. I know there was another country. And each one has eventually, I mean, in those kinds of circumstances, was able to go back and saying like, hey, we might as well empower, employ the local people here because they have the skill set because they've always had the skill set, but they just need to be taught how to modernize it and then to make it something more commercial. I get that it's so frustrating because I know in your heart of hearts, you would obviously prefer to do it in the UK, but it's like, yeah. what are you going to do? You're a small business and you want your product to sell and you want to get it into the hands of people. So it's like at some point you're playing this dance. Has anyone right. called you out on saying it's not manufactured in the UK whilst naming it London? No. See, nobody cares. No, no one has ever said that's me now, you know, why are you from London? You don't manufacture in London. I mean, I live in London, so the designs are designed in London. Yeah. So that I think yeah. that is, but nobody really, no. Yeah. I don't, we're not really known in London for, I don't know, for um, leather goods. I think if I was Italian, yeah. <laughs> that was going somewhere else, that might be different. <laughs> Where, I think um, in London. Where do you okay. think you're best well known now across the world? Do you think it's the US or do you think it's the UK at this point? I think it's the US. My goodness, we're currently stopped in shop box, but a lot of our customers, I'll say 60% of our customers are from the US. Yeah. Wow. New York. Yeah. New York, LA. And I'm, I'm so familiar with all the different states now. Yeah. We get a lot of our customers from the US. So I'm just, I love the US. <laughs> I love them in the US. I love their support. I love the fact that in the US, I think a female black owned brand, I think it's really celebrated in the US. And, mm -hmm. you know, that is just, 
it goes a long way, I think, in the U.S., yeah. Do you ever throw in Nigerian-born? Yeah, yeah, from time to time. I think you should. I think it's part of your brand. 100%. I think it's part of your DNA, and I think it's part of your story. And I think the relevance of brands with fans and, you know, as you said, USP, unique selling point, the customer right now is so much more discerning and Mm -hmm. she, he or they are much more keen to want to know the person behind the brand, want to know the why, want to know the inspiration. Whereas before that was just, you know, a lost page on your site called blog where you'd be like, I was walking down the countryside and a leaf (laughs) fell and lo and behold, now there's a bag inspired. Like it has to come from something real and the customer wants to see you take it for a test drive. They want to see you speaking about the value points of what makes it so special. And you, you, you yourself have turned into a, an influencer of some discretion, description <laughs> as well, which such a fan of watching you come out of cars. I was like, what's she wearing today? <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Love it. Love I think it. you're, I, I think you're right. When we started Florian, I really didn't, I detached <laughs> a lot from the brand. Um, because you get a PR company and people just want to know what magazine you're in or, not you per se, your bags are it, but right, now right. it's very different. People want to know what owns this brand, what's the story behind this brand, you know, how did she you know, start Florian? What inspires it? X, Y, Z. So that's why I started my personal Instagram page to sort of uh, show my day-to-day, not completely <laughs> child-free <laughs> miso. <laughs> I mean, you know, the funniest bit is since the pair of you have come to the awards, the second time when we re-honored you, not the first, because you came up, you you showed up alone the first. (laughs) And I remember you said on stage, I'm not John, just in case you were one. (laughs) But I'd like to say that he's been very Banksy. And since that time, I've never actually seen him again. So I firmly believe he's alive and kicking somewhere. (laughs) Yes, he is. (laughs) You can't um, it makes an appearance. No, no, no. It makes an appearance on my story from time to time, but not on my big feet. <laughs> oh my gosh! So, Tola, I am just such a huge, huge fan of Florian. Always have been. From the turquoise bag that won that best handbag in style and design, and mm-hmm. audience fan favorite. And there was a reason why. I think so many people gravitated towards it. And, you know, I can only say that you being part of our community, that all I want is good things coming to you because the brand, the brand should be sustainable because what what you've done for it and what you've created in your aesthetic and your eye. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I think people almost get annoyed hearing this cheesiness, but (laughs) if people haven't seen a Florian bag, it definitely carries its own DNA and I'm here to see it grow. I'm here for that. Thank you so much. Thank you. It means the world. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for your support over the years. It's really appreciated. <laughs> well, well, Tola, how can we, <laughs> we find you, follow Florian? How can we buy a beautiful bag of yours? Let us know. Okay, so I, Florian London, you can follow on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter. It's Florian London UK. You can follow me personally at Florian underscore T and then three E's. So that's T E E E. Not to make it any also, easier. <laughs> just to make it easier. And then also you can purchase Flurry London on www.florylondon.com. We're also stock on Shopbox. So you can also check us out on Shopbox. Huzzah. So, My dear, thank you. thank you so much for being part of the Handbag Designer 101 podcast. I can't wait to see what happens next. Talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to rate and review and follow us on every single platform at Handbag Designer. Thanks so much. See you next time.